Certainly not the least talk of the day. Ryan is going to tell us all about new awesome that's in Rails 5. Take it away, Ryan. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Let's give Chris a round of applause for putting this together today. It's very cool that we're having something like this very tech-heavy, focused, uh, you know, web type of conference here in Cincinnati. Usually, you have to leave town to get to something like this. So, very cool. Uh, hopefully, this will not be the last and, and just the first of many. So, um, being the last speaker of the day has its ups and downs. The down is that I have to worry that somebody else is going to steal the, you know, the, uh, the images that I'm going to use or, or the animations or the jokes. Um, but the good thing is, is I also get kind of a preview of what everyone else says so I don't accidentally say something that's uh, you know, really offensive to somebody else and what they're really jazzed about in their talk. So and now I know what I can't, uh, where I can't go. Um, I won't be so hard on JavaScript, I promise. <laughs> Uh, so, so far today, we have ridden a bus, and then we found some chemicals, we time traveled, we took an elixir that I think helped us do that time travel, and then we got struck by a meteor. Uh, so we've been through a lot of stuff today, and I'm going to try and, you know, keep things a little bit lighter today. I'm not going to go into a ton of code, and we're going to talk about some of the new things that are uh, coming up in Rails 5. So December 13th, 2015, that is a date in the future. It's a date in the future that signifies the 10-year anniversary of the 1.0 release of Rails. So you might have played with some of the earlier versions of Rails um, before that, but uh, December 13th, 2005 was when Rails 1.0 came out. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about like, what was going on in 2005. Where have we gone in these last 10 years? Um, and how has web development changed? So in 2005, the premier social network was MySpace. It was actually purchased in 2005 for $580 million, which today would seem like an absolute bargain deal. Uh, considering things like Instagram and whatnot being sold for a billion plus. Um, Facebook wasn't, it was around, but it wasn't publicly open until uh, 2006. Uh, MySpace actually is still a thing. A friend of mine uh, worked at MySpace in the, in the heyday on the development team, and he has some fantastic stories. But So MySpace is still around today, but as you can tell, they aren't really keeping up with the latest and greatest in uh, you know, web technologies. So uh, yeah, the glory days of MySpace have uh, definitely, definitely passed. So uh, we didn't even see iPhone until 2007. You know, this was, this was Blackberry days. And the, uh, what was the one? The, was it the Treo, the Trio? That was another one of those, like, kind of the pre-smartphone phones that um, did like WAP browsing and stuff like that. It was kind of terrible. But yeah, iPhone wasn't even a thing until 2007. Um, your desktops were way, way, way more popular than laptops. And I thought this was a little surprising, and I was thinking about it. I, I can't even remember using a desktop as my main PC. Um, I think... I, I mean, I definitely did in the early 2000s. I don't know if in 2005 if I had a laptop or not. I, maybe I didn't. Um, Wi-Fi wasn't really all that popular yet. Um, you did have 802.11b, which is uh, only 11 megabits, so um, basically worthless. And if you did have uh, Wi-Fi, you were definitely getting it through one of these awesome PCMCIA uh, dongles that would stick about two inches out of the side of your laptop and then would immediately get broken off. Um, so yeah, those were, those were different times. But also interesting, in 2005, this happened. We had the kind of tipping point between broadband home access over dial-up. And when you start to look at some of the data that, about trends of, of internet usage and social media usage and things like that, you can see why, and it, it really ties back to this, all of a sudden you weren't using your telephone and getting 
horrible, you know, 56K or 28.8 speeds, you were actually getting a broadband connection. Um, and so kind of trending along that same, same time frame, you see uh, social media going from just being kind of a creepy thing to a very commonplace, and I, and I guess still sort of creepy sometimes thing, but it, it's become a lot more commonplace. 80% uh, nearly of adults are using some kind of social media. So will Facebook face the same fate as MySpace? Probably not. This is a very different number of users and age range of users than back here in 2005 when MySpace was around. So when you think, ah, oh, yeah, Facebook's going to be gone in a couple years just like MySpace was, oh, maybe not. But that's neither here nor there. Um, if we think about the last five years, so 2010, that's when we start seeing mobile devices really take off. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty strange. I, I don't know what happened right here, but all of a sudden there's all these mobile devices. So this is, this is kind of a noisy chart, but there's, there's uh, MP3 players, ebook readers, um, smartphones, game portable uh, gaming devices, things like that are all on this. Uh, this green line here, that's smartphones. So that stuff, you know, really taking off. But it, it, it's around this 2010 point that all of a sudden we started getting all sorts of diversity in devices that people are using to, um, I, I guess, take in media in general because some of these things aren't necessarily internet devices, but a lot of them are. Sort of obvious. How, things, how the devices are used throughout the day. You have more mobile phones in the morning during the commute. You have a lot of PCs during work hours. You have tablets being really popular at night. But this could represent the same person using the same sites, and they just happen to use all these different devices. And so it's pretty clear why there's an expectation that something I'm doing on my laptop I should be able to just pick up on my, on my cell phone and be able to look at the exact same thing and pick up right where I left off uh, with all the same context and everything. This is a study out of Canada, but I think it probably applies more or less everywhere. Um, they say more engaging, and I think that's a stretch on what they actually studied, but they're saying that uh, mobile accounts for 56% of the time spent on the internet. Now that's not all going to be web, that's going to be apps and things like that, but a lot of those apps are powered by things that we're building on the back ends. And there is quite a bit of web in there. The thing to think about though, especially when we talk about all these JavaScript frameworks, and like I said, I'm going to be sensitive to everybody else's interests in the room, uh, JavaScript is very popular, but JavaScript is very, very slow on a lot of mobile devices. Both slow computationally and just because it's pushing the device. Hard on the battery. So that's something you need to think about. Uh, the, this is from uh, Anantech, and it's the uh, Mozilla Kraken benchmark. And you know, it's a benchmark, so it's not exactly a real world usage type thing, but it's somewhat regarded. Um, the newest iPhones, uh, are kind of king of the hill right now. Lower is better. This is total elapsed time in milliseconds to complete the whole benchmark suite. Um, it's king of the hill right now, but a new medium range desktop PC or you know, a newer MacBook is going to do that in a little more than half that time. So it's going to be right around a second total to run through this benchmark. And the latest and greatest uh, smartphone on the market is almost you know, twice as slow as that. You kind of go down here and you see how quickly. I mean, this is, this is 10 times what that is. And the, the Nexus 5 is not a, a slouch of a phone. Um, and when you're thinking about this, these are all relatively newer phones. But we kind of live in this little bubble of technology. You know, we all have new phones and things like that, and you know, we aren't really putting up with the older equipment. I was at the Bengals game on Thursday, 
And you know, you just kind of, you're taking it all in. And I see this guy in front of me, pulls out his phone to take a picture. And it looked like he was holding a little miniature phone. And it was like an iPhone 3GS. So these things are out in the wild, and people are using them as their day-to-day -day phone. I don't even know what the 3GS scores on this, but I'm guessing it's probably 20, 30 seconds to complete the benchmark on here. So you just have to keep that in mind. JavaScript performance on mobile will eventually get very good, but it's not there yet. And so if you're building a very heavyweight uh, JavaScript application, you should be at least testing to see how it performs on older uh, devices that are out there. OK, so we're supposed to be talking about Rails, right? Um, <laughs> some people are using these smartphones. Some people are using desktops. So what? Right? Well, so what? In, uh, it somewhat feels like what's happened in the last 10 years is kind of like the story of Rails. And people think about Rails as like, well, it was the original yellow fade effect on um, a, an Ajax form update. And that was like the big thing we were celebrating. But that's old school technology. Rails is old. You're not going to write a new Rails app and then brag about it on Hacker News. You know, you're just, you're not going to get any, you're not going to get any respect over there if it's not, you know, some new JavaScript framework that came out a month or two ago. Um, that is somewhat true. Rails has been a little bit behind the times. Um, they have updated a lot of things, but when it comes to developing these single page applications, um, Rails doesn't really provide a solution for it right now. You have to bolt on other technologies, which is totally okay in today's Rails, uh, but it's, it's not something that you can do easily out of the box. So a big part of the Rails 5 update is to kind of change that reputation that Rails has. Or at least, if it doesn't change the reputation, it changes the, um, it changes it in the minds of the developers who are using Rails. Because even if other people have this impression that Rails is just for old school websites and not modern apps, well, that's, that's fine. You know, they can do that. They can think that if they want. But we know that we have the tools that we need, and <laughs> hate is going to hate. So we're talking about building modern web apps. What is it? What is a modern web app? And like I was saying, it used to be this thing that you got through your web browser on your desktop computer. You typed in some information on a form. You hit submit. The page reloads. And you're looking at something that says, congratulations, your submission was successful. Um, still, a web app today is more or less that. But things are a little fancier. And like we saw, the devices that people are using come in all shapes, sizes, capabilities. And sometimes, with the case of uh, you know, pure native apps, they don't have a browser at all. And you're just you know, rendering to an API, essentially. So a couple examples. This is one that's popular right now. Uh, is everyone here in the Cincy Tech Slack? If anyone's not, go check out that URL up there and join us. Uh, it's a great resource. There's about you know, 300 local technology people in there. And it's, you know, it's great for uh, spending a little water cooler time in there to chat. Uh, great for getting suggestions on how to uh, do something that you're trying to do. And it's a great job resource also. Um, you know, there's a jobs channel. And if you free up, you can post the thing out there that says, hey, I just freed up. Is anybody hiring? And I'm sure you will very quickly get a few responses. Uh, I took this screenshot recently, and I made sure I got this one because Jake here is saying, you Ruby people get all the good stuff. So I thought that was kind of neat. And he's right. Slack is, of course, available in the desktop application, which is really just a web view similar to the way the Atom editor works. But they've got a tablet app. They've got a phone app. Um, there's an expectation that when you go between those things, uh, you're going to have all of the same messages and context that you had, regardless of what device you're using at what time. 
Uh, Basecamp 3. This is the new uh, version of Basecamp. A lot of Rails 5 is being extracted from the updates that they made to the Basecamp application. Uh, just like Rails 1.0 was an extraction from the original Basecamp application, um, some of the new stuff that they built into here is uh, going to be in Rails 5. And just like the others, Basecamp has a goal of being everywhere on all devices. Their take on this is that they are very web focused. They don't build, they don't have a very large team. They don't want to build a lot of pure native apps. So, and actually some of these screenshots are not the new Basecamp. Um, they're, that's the older Basecamp, but the new Basecamp has um, native apps that have web views in them. And they have gone through to great lengths to make those web views feel very much like a native application. And the work that they've put into that are things that we're going to be able to leverage as Rails developers once Rails 5 is, is out in the wild and we can start building our own apps with that. Uh, Shopify, they are a great example of a uh, Rails success story. These guys um, push gobs of, of page views, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of page views a month, and they're all running it on a Rails app, and they're targeting other devices too. Here's their um, mobile versions of their devices that are actually point of sale systems that they can put in retailer shops. Um, and all of this is driven from a Rails backend. So when it comes to talking about frameworks, you want your framework to give you a comfortable programming environment that allows you to meet all of these different modern needs of what's expected of web applications. And that's, that's not an easy task. So as we've seen today, it's pretty complicated. We talked about a lot of technologies today, and I'm a professional programmer who has been you know, doing this for uh, you know, 15 plus years or more now, and I don't use 90% of the things that we've talked about all day. And my days are full of programming. Uh, and I'm you know, putting out applications and things like that, and I'm sure other people in the room can say similar things depending on which talks they're hearing. There are a ton of technologies out there right now. And so if you're new to building a web application, where do you even start? How do you know what the right things are to do? And probably more importantly, especially when you're talking about security, how do you know what are the wrong things to do? You know, you can really shoot yourself in the foot and if you're if you do it bad enough or well enough, if you screw up good enough, you can find yourself in the newspaper somewhere. So this is what Rails does. This is what Rails does here. The goal of the Rails project, and it really always has been the goal of the Rails project, is to create a framework and a set of tools and a set of defaults that give a developer the best shot possible at creating a successful application without having to figure out, oh man, well what do I use for my uh, you know, interface between my database and my models? You know, what architecture should I use to begin with? MVC, I guess so, that's what, that's what Rails is giving me. Um, you know, what kind of uh, templating language do I use? How do I um, you know, manage assets and things like that? Those are all things that Rails has made some decisions, oftentimes controversial decisions, about, well, this is what we think is the best thing for you to do. And you are welcome to disagree with us. And I think, as Kevin had pointed out, it wasn't always the case that it was OK to disagree with uh, what the Rails core team thought was OK. But nowadays, it is. Um, you're welcome to bring in things that you want, like, for example, our script, or uh, not our, uh, our spec. Almost everybody uses RSpec, but it's not part of the Rails core project. They want you to use Minitest. I don't know anybody who's using Minitest actively. Everybody I know is using RSpec. 
but that's totally fine. I know a lot of people hate the idea of CoffeeScript. Personally, I kind of like it because I'm not primarily a JavaScript developer. And to me, CoffeeScript is just really easy. There's not as much context switching pain going between Ruby code and JavaScript code when I'm doing it in CoffeeScript. And I don't write a ton of it. Um, so, you know, for me, CoffeeScript works great. But if you're familiar with JavaScript and you'd rather just write bare metal JavaScript, that's fine too. Remove the CoffeeScript gem and it's gone from your project. Uh, and that's totally supported and totally OK. Um, these things, you know, they haven't really changed. And, and just the new features are more ways to give you um, the ability to create the kinds of applications that you're expected to build today. Highly interactive, available on multiple platforms. Um, functions just like a native application, even though it's really just a 2005-era web app at heart. So the first thing that um, they've added has been around for a while. There was this thing called the Rails API gem. And this project, basically, you could add it to your project and use it to uh, strip things out of the Rails framework. Um, it made it so that you would you know, skip middleware, um, add in the active model serializers, um, don't do any view rendering, get jQuery out of there, turn off CSERF protection, all that stuff that you need to do when you're building an API with Rails and you don't care about any of the view rendering stuff. Um, they've added that into um, Rails proper. And so now, all you have to do when you start a new Rails app, you can, you know, Rails new, my awesome API, and you give it, you know, tac tac API, and it does all that stuff for you. And so now you have a nice, clean slate to start with for building an API uh, using Rails as your back end. And that's great, and that's what some people want to do, especially if you're using some of these uh, JavaScript MVC frameworks. You can still use Rails on the back end, and this just makes it a little bit easier to get there. It's kind of funny because every time DHH, uh, David Hennemeyer Hansen, the, the uh, kind of founder, I guess, of Rails in a way, and he's one of the main core team members now, uh, every time he talks about this feature, he, he says it almost a little begrudgingly. Like, yeah, we, we have this, but you don't want to use it. I, I, I don't take it that far, but you know, it. I guess it's worth saying. He's compromising, and that's a good step. <laughs> In the past, that would not have happened, but he's compromising. Um, so anyway, so this is here if you want to use it. But I think if you are building a new uh, Rails application, you should, before you decide that, well, I'm building this new application, I better learn how to use Ember. And maybe I can still use Rails on the back end, or I better learn how to use Angular, and I can still use Rails on the back end, but man, the front end, I've got to do it all different now. First, try out some of these new things that are coming in Rails 5 that are um, you know, going to help bridge the gap from the old to the new. TurboLinks 3. We'll, we'll get to it. So TurboLinks 3 is ready to roll, but a few days ago, I heard DHH talking about TurboLinks 5. And it's, I thought, he said it on a podcast, and I was like, oh, he must have just made a mistake. You know, that's, he's talking Rails 5, and he was talking about TurboLinks, and he just said TurboLinks 5, whatever. And then as I was doing more research about this, it turns out that TurboLinks 5 really is what's coming out with uh, Rails 5. And so I have lots of questions about this. The first is, what happened to TurboLinks 4? And I, it, actually, I think that, that's my only question about this. But what happened to TurboLinks 4? Where did that go? And what's the story? Um, TurboLinks 3 is available today. It is not officially released, but it's at a point where you could very easily use it if you wanted to. It's considered pretty stable. Um, and it has a lot of great new features that weren't available in the original TurboLinks. It turns out this whole TurboLinks 3, TurboLinks 5 thing. Yep. 
I, I'm going to get there. Okay. I'll, yeah, sorry, I'll get there in a second. Uh, the, the main driver for this, before we get into what, wait, what is TurboLinks? Before we get there, uh, the main driver is these new um, mobile apps that they've written for Basecamp, which are actually really slick. Um, they had to rewrite a bunch of stuff in, in the TurboLinks code in order to make it work and feel really, really native when you're using it on iOS and Android. And so it was enough of a change that they decided to bump the version two points, I guess. Um, so that's a big, big jump. Um, and uh, so they're going to be extracting that from the, uh, the Basecamp 3 code, and it will be available when Rails 5 is released. So yeah, it is what it is. And now the first thing that you might be thinking is, if you've done any Rails development is, doesn't everyone just disable TurboLinks? I thought that was the big joke about Rails is that, you know, the TurboLinks was this new feature and it's this new feature that everybody just disables. It was like that. In the original TurboLinks, to answer the questions, wait, what is TurboLinks? TurboLinks was a follow-on to this idea that, uh, I forget the name uh, of, of the developer, but they put out this idea called PJAX. And so the concept was, you know what an AJAX call is from your, uh, from your website. You can make a call back to the uh, server and get a response, and you can you know, use that in JavaScript to manipulate your page without having to do a whole page reload. Well, someone figured out that your browser actually spends a whole lot of time parsing, interpreting, uh, and, and you know, processing the JavaScript and the CSS files. But that happens every time you load a page, even though those files never change. So what if we used AJAX to make it so that when you load the web page, you load it once and you, you process the JavaScript and the styles and you build that whole model and then you just leave that stuff alone. And then anytime you click a link on the page, instead of sending a Git request to the server and doing a whole page refresh, which means you have to go through that processing step again and that setup again, we'll just take everything that's between the body tags, throw it away and replace it with the new stuff. And it turns out that that actually is a win. You get a nice little performance boost um, when you're using the original TurboLinks or PJAX uh, to do that sort of thing. And that was cool, but you run into all sorts of problems around the edges. It works great in a demo. It works great in a very simple website. Um, you can have a very simple website that's almost all static HTML, and you, know, you click those links and the pages just load instantaneously as if, wow, man, they must load all this stuff and then do some fancy DOM switching behind the scenes. But, no, it's normal page loads. It's just using this uh, PJAX thing. Um, but once you got into more complicated things, you started talking about form submissions and stuff, it all just fell apart and it became a thorn in everyone's side. So basically, the first thing you do on a new Rails project is you disable TurboLinks. Um, what has changed in TurboLinks 3 is that now, instead of just kind of um, with a, uh, you, you know, kind of a ham-fisted approach of replacing the entire body of the document, now you have this concept of partial replacement. And so I can use TurboLinks 3 to say that, oh, all of my uh, content here is static. It's not going to change, except there's this one area of the DOM here. So there's this div over here. And this is something that I want to dynamically update using TurboLinks. And so an example of that could be um, you have static stuff on your page, like a menu and some body content and stuff like that. But then maybe you have user stuff, like a shopping cart or something like that. And if you wanted to have a shopping cart on your website, well, every time you load that page, you're going to have to interpret the user's information about what's in their current shopping cart. And you're going to have to put that into the HTML and um, you know, send the page to their browser. Well, and that kind of broke caching and all sorts of things like that. But now with partial replacement, you can say that, oh, well, this whole page is static except for this one little area called the shopping cart. 
and TurboLynx is going to lazy load that for me. So when you send the initial page down to the browser, it's not even going to have the user shopping cart in there. It's just going to have an empty div tag with a TurboLynx uh, tag inside it that says, hey, um, you know, update this stuff with the shopping cart information. And so once that page loads, then the JavaScript is going to make a call back to the server, get the information for that specific user's shopping cart, and replace the contents of that div with the, uh, with the information. And so that is super fast, and it allows you to do very aggressive caching on huge chunks of your website. And the only exceptions become these little bits that you actually still have to process and can't cache. Um, so and I think I've talked about most of the things that, uh, that you have here, but this, if you're familiar with a Rails controller, this is the change to the Rails controller to support this. Um, you have a, a, you know, your, your create method and you create a new comment. So say this is like a, a blog post and has comments. Someone submits a comment. That form submits via AJAX. It comes in. And when we redirect back to the updated post, we pass this parameter, change and comments. That's the area. That's the div, the ID of the div that's going to actually get updated. And so there's a lot of things to notice about this. You've seen this code earlier today in some of the Phoenix talks. And that's because the TurboLynx 3 changes were uh, in some ways influenced by um, the things that have come out of, of Phoenix. More so the WebSocket stuff we'll talk about later, but it's the same kind of, uh, of concept that, hey, we're going to render our view, and we're just going to change this one little area. OK? The cool thing about this is if for some reason TurboLynx isn't turned on on the user's browser, this will still work. And the only difference is that instead of getting you know, just that one little div replaced on their screen nice and fast, they're going to see a whole page load. But if they have JavaScript disabled or what, for whatever reason, this will still work without making any changes to your, um, your application. Shopify is primarily to thank for the changes that are in the new TurboLink stuff. So Shopify used to have their own JavaScript MVC framework called uh, Batman, Batman JS, and which I think had a cool logo, didn't it? It probably did. It was Batman JS. So they had this JavaScript MVC thing, and they were using that. And for whatever reason, they decided they were going to get away from that. And they couldn't use TurboLinks as it was because it was too dumb. Instead, they decided, well, we're going to spend some time adding features to TurboLynx that will allow us to use it. And now they don't use a JavaScript MVC framework. They use TurboLynx. So Shopify is using TurboLynx. They do 300 million page views a month with an average response time of 100 milliseconds. That's pretty serious performance. And that is very much near native performance when you're you know, an end user on that thing. And because you're only replacing a single div and not reloading the whole page, you have very little, uh, you don't have any connection set up overhead uh, because you already have the, the, the connection established. Um, you don't have to you know, re-render the whole page and rebuild the whole DOM. Um, and you're just changing this one little element. So things fly. It feels very much like a, um, a native app. And in fact, I will look at a, here is a TurboLynx 3 version of to-do MVC. And we'll see, I don't even know if I'm connected to the internet, so let's see what's happening here. All right, oh, actually, yeah, so it's up and running. All right, so um, finish talk, I haven't done that yet. Let me say, uh, you know, start the talk. And you know that was fast, and you know I can do things like you know check that off because it's done. I started the talk. This is not maintaining the state in the client. It is maintaining the state in the server that's running on Heroku, 
And those updates that you're seeing to the view are happening over the wire. And these components here that are being re-rendered are not being re-rendered in JavaScript. They're being re-rendered on the server in the normal views, uh, the, 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 e, the ERB uh, files, the, the template files, um, on the server side. So what this means is that with this kind of technology, you can build apps that feel like single page apps that are driving over the wire. So you don't have to maintain your model on both the server side and then rebuild a mostly true representation of it on the, on the client side and you know, try to manipulate that and hope you're keeping it in sync and then worry about like, well, I'm using local storage here to make it quick, but eventually I need to persist that back over to the server and hope everything works out. Um, and I need to write my HTML using JavaScript, and I can do that with some different syntax. And I'm not bashing that, because I know there are people, especially like Josh, who are very productive in that type of environment. But for me, I'm a Rails developer, and I've been doing this for a long time. I'm really efficient at writing Rails views and using the Rails stack. And if I can get SPA performance by using something like partial replacement and have all my views rendered on the server side, and I only have to build my model once, and I only have to build my view code once in one place, that's a huge win. Um, and just to prove to you that this is, I don't know if this does prove it or not. Let's see here. I will open up another instance of this, and it should have all my same stuff. Although I think that might work. Um, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert in how local storage in JavaScript worked. If I open the same app, in a different window, would I, have, would I be sharing that local storage? I don't know. You would? OK. Well, then this doesn't prove anything to you. Uh, yeah, that's true. I could open a different browser. Um, but I'm not going to do that because the way this app works is it is keyed off a session. There's no login or anything like that. And so without like dumping my cookies and copying them over, there's no way I could like, you know, reconnect to this user session. Um, this is just a demo application that uh, uh, Nate Berkopek uh, put out there. Um, one thing to note, though, is that you see I crossed that off there, and that change didn't automatically happen on this other window. Because this isn't, this isn't WebSockets. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, this isn't a thing where, oh, hey, you know, you made this change on this instance, and it's instantly going to show up over here. This is just partial replacement. But this will allow me to illustrate something kind of cool. If I then check, say, take the dog out, did you see what happened? Both of these are now checked on here. So eventually, this state got synced up. The reason that that state got synced up is because that state is not being maintained on the client side. Like we said before, that state is being rendered on the server on Heroku and then re-delivering re this whole area of to-do items. Um, so anyway, it makes uh, that state management thing uh, a lot simpler as a result. Um, so anyway. The idea is that you know, everyone just kind of disabled Turbo Links in the past is true. Turbo Links 3 or 5 or whatever you want to call it is nothing like the old Turbo Links. They should almost change the name of it. And in fact, that's what Shopify did. So when Shopify forked Turbo Links to add on these new features, um, they called it Turbo Graft. And it is available out there on, um, on GitHub in their repo. Um, and I thought that name was kind of similar to that, so. <laughs> Did anyone have a TurboGrafx-16? That was a cool system, wasn't it? Yeah, I like that Splatterhouse game. That was cool. They had the green blood. Yeah. 
All right, so we didn't see those live updates that you might have expected when you, we've talked about all these WebSocket enabled uh, JavaScript applications before, you might expect to see like, oh man, he checked that box on this browser and it didn't instantly update over here. That's kind of a bummer. Uh, I'll remind you that my Twitter handle is at Lebowski, so if you don't get this reference at all, I'm sorry, but you should go watch The Big Lebowski. It's funny, trust me. Um, don't watch it with the kids. Um, what is Action Cable? So Action Cable is easy WebSockets for your Rails app. WebSockets, you can do WebSockets in a Rails app today. You can add in a variety of gems and, and some configuration and you can make it work. But it's not easy. And remember, the goal of the Rails project is to uh, put together a, um, a package that lets you go out and start building a web application without worrying about, oh, do I need to find this other library over here? I need to find this other library over here. You can build a successful application with just what you have in the box and use the defaults. That's the goal anyway. Um, and so we were missing WebSockets, but now we have them with Action Cable. So it, it's just like some of the other things we've seen earlier today. It is a persistent two-way connection um, from the clients to the, uh, to the back end. It is inspired a lot by the, um, the Phoenix framework uh, from Elixir. And it includes everything you need. It's full stack. So it's got um, the client side JavaScript stuff that knows how to talk to the API that is sitting on the server side. And so it means you don't have to write a ton of JavaScript to make this available to your application. You just need to sprinkle a little JavaScript here and there. And that's kind of been the traditional Rails way of doing things, is you do little sprinklings of JavaScript as you need it, as opposed to building the bulk of your application there. Um, from the earlier talks today, these terms are going to seem very familiar. An action cable connection uh, is the class that handles authorization, the connection logic, uh, Re-establishing connections, expiring dead connections, things like that, that's in the connection class. A channel, just like in Phoenix, um, a client will subscribe to a channel. They will subscribe to any channel that they're interested in, maybe multiple. So they're going to have one connection to your service or to your server, but they can subscribe to multiple channels. So a user could say, um, your client, the client side of your application can say, well, we are interested in updates about the count of items in this user's mailbox. We're interested in new chat messages that come in, and we're interested in um, some kind of maybe notifications or something like that. You can subscribe to all of those channels, and um, on the back end, you have this, this stack called the uh, broadcaster that will send the relevant messages to the clients that are subscribed to those channels. So if a user's inbox gets updated, for example, the broadcaster will take care of, hey, I need to send an updated inbox count to the client that is connected on that inbox updates channel. Um, there is a whole stack of tools that are involved in this. Rails packages it all up for you. Uh, but basically, you're using uh, the Redis pub sub um, capabilities to um, make this all happen. Um, Turbo Links is pretty straightforward in how it works. Action Cable, also pretty straightforward in how it works. But I'm not going to show you a bunch of the code, just because you, know, you can't absorb, even though it's not that much code, you can't really absorb that and take much away from it uh, today. If you're interested in this kind of thing, we'll definitely be doing sessions on it in uh, upcoming Ruby user groups. So if this is the kind of thing you want to see a more in-depth look at, I think I might have just signed myself up for doing some more talks at the Ruby user group uh, by saying that. But, <laughs> but that's where we'll go more in-depth. But just know that um, Action Cable is basically WebSockets without a whole lot of pain in trying to get it set up. Oh, shit. <laughs> OK, so a couple, these are some more, more like quickies. Um, these are other things that are coming. ActiveRecord now has an OR method. 
This is one of those things that, you know, you see this question all the time when people start using Active Record. They say, oh, this is great. How do I do an OR? And you have to say, well, you just have to write the SQL because you can't do an OR. But now you can do an OR. Um, this, is, uh, this is the test, right, from the test code in um, Active Record. So this is kind of the old way you would do it. You know, you'd say post where ID equals one or ID equals two. Um, here, in the new way, we're gonna say post where ID equals one dot or, and then you pass in a new active record relation. And if you think through the logic of like, how would you implement or, you can see why, oh yeah, or is a little more complicated than just like chaining where's together. Because when you do that, um, you know, it's easy to just smash all those together with and, but how do you tell active record that, no, I don't want and, I want or. How do you implement that in a way that's not surprising or error prone? Um, so anyway, we've got or, yay. This is kind of neat, the uh, attributes API that's being added to um, Active Model. And it will let you do things, um, it will let you do a few different things. So it, it lets you define the type of a column. So normally, the way Active Record works is it interrogates the database schema, um, and that's how it knows what attributes your models have and what the types of those uh, attributes are supposed to be. And you know, types don't matter as much in the Ruby side, but when you actually persist it out to the database, you better know what data type it's supposed to be so that you can convert it as needed. Um, so if we look at it kind of the old way of doing things, if we created a table called store listings and we had a price in sense that for some reason was a decimal uh, field afloat, um, and then we create our model, store listing, what would happen if we said, hey, we're gonna create a new store listing and the price in cents is uh, 10.1 cents. I, I guess gasoline is kind of priced that way. It's always, you know, 99.9 .9 at the end. Um, in the old way of doing things, when you called, hey, store listing, give me the price in cents, it's gonna return to you this float, and it's gonna be 10.1. The new way of doing things you can declare that, hey, um, store listing has a price in cents, and I want it to be an integer. At least as far as Rails is concerned, I want this to be an integer. I don't care what it's stored as in the database. To me, it's an integer. And so when you do the same thing here, now when you call price in cents, you get back 10. And when you turn around and you persist this back into the database, Active Record will handle the casting for you to make sure that whatever this is set to gets casted back properly so that it can be stored in the actual column type in your database. Another thing you can do with the Attributes API is you can say, hey, um, I don't actually have a database table backing this, or maybe I do and these are a couple of additional fields that I'm specifying. Uh, you would call these virtual fields, and you used to implement these with just you know, instance variables and, and accessors in your Ruby code. Now we have this standardized way to do it through the attribute um, API. And so we're saying, hey, we have a string called my string, and it has a default value. Uh, you actually, with default values, you have the ability to override the default value that is defined in your database table, which I think is a horrible idea, but you can do it. Um, I guess you, you know, it's good to know. Um, we have an integer array, we have a float range, and then we can create a new model here, and we can provide it some of those, uh, some of those attributes um, on the initializer, and then when we call attributes back, we see that we got our defaulted uh, string that was defaulted to Cincy, and then we got these attributes that we passed in. And so in this example, there is no database table that's backing this uh, this model, this is just kind of the way it's uh, working out of the box here with the new Attributes API. Uh, another thing you can do with the Attributes API, so it's easy to cast between you know, a, a, a decimal and an integer. What if you wanted to do something more complicated? So using the whole money concept again, let's say, well, we want to store a price and we want to store it in cents as an integer but sometimes we might be initializing it with a string that has a dollar sign in front of it and it's expressed in dollars. 
So we define our own type, called a money type, and we uh, implement the cast method, and we check to see, hey, does, the, does that thing include a dollar sign? And if it does, you know, basically just strip out the dollar sign, multiply it by 100, and that's our cents as an integer. We register this new type with Active Record so it knows about it. And then in our store listing, we say, hey, we have this attribute um, price in cents, and it is of type money. That's the type that we defined up there. And now when we create a new store listing and we say, hey, the price in cents is string $10, it will do the right thing and it will use your custom implementation to um, you know, convert that. They actually have some other examples where they're doing like, um, you know, uh, lookups on um, currency conversion and stuff like that. And uh, that stuff to me seems like, well, you can do it that way, but it feels like that's really surprising that it would be implemented like that. So I think we'll see how this shakes out and how people use the attributes API. Um, has secure token is a thing, and there's not really much to say about this, but if you need to like create invite codes or something like that for your app, you can say, hey, has secure token invitation code. And now your, um, your model has an invitation code, and you can call on it, and it will use the secure random function to generate this for you. And um, you know, that's really all there is to say about this, but there's, this is something that you tend to do from time to time in apps, and you used to have to implement it by hand, and this just does it as a one-liner. Uh, a few other changes. There's a lot of performance improvements with Rails 5. Um, you have to use uh, Ruby 222. Um, the main reasons for that are the improved garbage collection capabilities and uh, specifically the fact that it can garbage collect symbols. So that kind of longstanding issue of, well, you can DDoS a Rails app by figuring out a way to make it create lots and lots of symbols because those never get garbage collected and it eventually will run out of memory. Um, that's avoided by this. Uh, they have made, under the hood, tons of um, improvements in memory usage, object uh, creation, and you know you, you can look at the, the, the release notes when it comes out and they'll you know, describe all these things, but suffice it to say there's a lot of time has been spent on doing performance improvements in the Rails code base. Um, the tricks editor, this is a new like WYSIWYG uh, JavaScript editor that you can drop into a text area field. It's um, on the new Basecamp site. It's actually pretty slick. It's one of the nicer WYSIWYG editors that I've seen. And I know that those things usually, usually are a pain to deal with and you know, output very surprising HTML. Um, but this one is you know, written by 37 signals and it works in a non-surprising way and I imagine it is plug and play and generates reasonable HTML for you. So that's worth checking out kind of as a separate thing if you need a, a WYSIWYG editor. Now, should I upgrade? You probably shouldn't up, update just yet. There's a lot of changes. Get it? Um, <laughs> you should probably play with the release candidates because there is some really neat stuff. But with anything, you don't want to, on day one, upgrade your apps to Rails 5. That said, even if you aren't planning on using the new Turbo Links or the new Action Cable stuff, the performance improvements that you're going to get and the memory consumption improvements that you're going to get are going to make it worth it. So maybe you know 5.0.1, you're going to want to make the jump. When you do go in, Action Cable probably isn't going to be something you use right away. Not everyone has a use case for a, a two-way web socket type of, of implementation. It's just not appropriate for every type of application. Uh, but Turbo Links is definitely worth taking a look at, um, especially because you've, if you're a Rails developer, you've probably already cast it off in your mind. But even on a Hacker News comment, I saw someone say, I have stopped using TurboLinks the day it came out, but I recently tried TurboLinks 3 and thought it was really awesome, and now I use it all the time. 
So if somebody posting on Hacker News is, is you know, saying Turbo Links is great, you know, it's worth checking out. That's all I got. Thank you very much.